Good morning. We want to start on time and uh, end on time. So I, we would like to uh, welcome everyone to Dorsey and Whitney's first inaugural Future of Agriculture Roundtable. The first of what we hope will be an annual event of assembling leaders in agriculture to discuss their vision on the future of farming, processing and distributing our food globally and, and our bioproducts globally in a low carbon and sustainable manner. Hi, my name is Michael Weaver. I practice cooperative and corporate law in the food and agribusiness industries uh, at Dorsey and Whitney's Minneapolis office. We're very excited about the group of leaders that we've assembled for today's program starting with Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. We were especially pleased that Secretary Vilsack asked to pre-record his keynote address and question and answer session uh, last week as he was uh, uh, invited to a White House event here this morning. So with that, here is Secretary Vilsack's pre-recorded keynote address. I'm delighted and it is my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, United States Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. Most of you know that Secretary Vilsack was nominated by President Biden and confirmed as the United States Secretary of Agriculture by the US Senate earlier this year. He returned to a role where he served for eight years under President Obama. Secretary Vilsack has worked hard to strengthen the American agricultural economy, build vibrant rural communities and create new markets for innovation in rural America. He fought to put Americans back to work by investing in rural infrastructure, renewable energy and large scale conservation partnerships. Under his leadership, the USDA supports Americans, America's farmers, ranchers and growers who drive the rural economy forward growing processing and, and distributing our food globally set records for u.s agricultural export provided food assistance to millions of americans and helped provide a safe sufficient and nutritious food supply for american people and people around the world without further ado please join me in welcoming secretary of agriculture of the united states tom vilsack well, thank you very, very much. I appreciate the kind introduction. And uh, uh, certainly I would include in my uh, CV the fact that I was uh, associated with Dorsey and Whitney for a number of years prior to becoming Secretary of Agriculture in the Obama administration and certainly enjoyed my time working with uh, the folks in the Des Moines office. Um, and so it's good to be back with, uh, with folks at Dorsey and Whitney. And what a great uh, topic uh, to talk about the future of agriculture. Uh, and what an incredibly diverse uh, area uh, and business and industry this is. Uh, let me start with the good news. Uh, recently, we've seen two pieces of data that I think are, are, are helpful. Uh, first, the fact that we're on pace uh, to have a record export year. Exports incredibly important to U.S. agriculture. Any, uh, on any given year, 20 to 30 percent of our, of our uh, income uh, from farming comes from our, what we export. So to the extent that we have a record year in exports, it obviously means uh, help uh, to the bottom line for farmers, ranchers, and producers. Uh, in addition, we're also projecting that that record that is being set this year will be broken next year. Uh, so it looks like we're going to have a strong uh, export activity over the course of the next couple of years. And that I think has translated uh, into the fact that uh, net farm income, uh, according to the Economic Research Service report recently uh, issued, is now above uh, the 20 year average for the first time in a number of years. We've seen a net increase in farm income which is certainly welcome news. Uh, you know, the challenge with a, a, a statistic like that is that it doesn't necessarily mean that every farmer in the country, every rancher in the country is actually being uh, helped uh, with this economy. But it does indicate that the state of agriculture is improving. Uh, there is, however, one very troublesome uh, statistic, which I've been talking a lot about recently. And that is that roughly 89.6% of American farms do not generate the majority of farm income for the folks who own and operate those farms. In other words, in order for nearly 90% of our farmers to be able to keep the farm, they have to have off-farm income. And we at USDA believe that we need to do something about that. We need to have more profit for more farmers. 
Uh, and so we focused on a three-pronged strategy, uh, which I think does define in part the future of agriculture. Uh, and that strategy is really about more new and better markets. Uh, let me just briefly touch on all three of those aspects. When we talk about more markets, we're obviously talking about more export opportunities as well. Uh, in addition to China, we're looking at ways in which we can expand significantly uh, efforts in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're doing this through uh, negotiations and through discussions with uh, ag ministers across uh, the Southeast Asia to try to identify and reduce barriers that currently exist to the sale of American products. We recently had some success uh, in the reduction of tariffs and some of the uh, sanitary and phytosanitary barriers that Vietnam, for example, has uh, posed uh, that has made it a bit more difficult for us to enter that fairly uh, important and significant market. Uh, we're obviously focused on as well on, on full enforcement of the uh, USMCA, the trade agreement between Canada and Mexico. Uh, we are pleased with the fact that the U.S. Trade Representative's Office is taking a hard line with our friends in Canada uh, in terms of the implementation of the dairy provisions uh, of that agreement, because that is one of the principal reasons why that agreement was approved uh, by the ag community, uh, community uh, generally. Uh, we thought there was a potential opportunity for profit uh, for the dairy industry. and want to make sure that that's realized. We're also working with our Mexican counterparts to make sure that they understand and appreciate their responsibilities, everything from uh, biotechnology to, to making sure that there is easy transfer uh, across border uh, crossings to make sure that we are in a position to take full advantage of that important market. Exports are important uh, and expanding opportunity uh, short term in Southeast Asia, long term uh, in Africa, uh, looking for ways in which we could potentially grow relationships uh, in that important continent. One half of all of the net new uh, population increases in this in this world are going to occur over the next 15 years in that continent. Uh, so there's a tremendous budding opportunity uh, for American agriculture. But it's not just about exports. It's also about developing local and regional food systems. What we were able to determine during the pandemic is that we had a very efficient food system. But when we had a national disruption uh, that the pandemic caused in terms of food service basically being shut down uh, and having to transfer to food assistance, we found that our system was not as resilient as it needs to be. Uh, so uh, creating and developing a series of local and regional food systems uh, to supplement and complement uh, our sort of our commodity-based system, our national and international system, uh, we believe uh, will create greater resiliency and create more, uh, more markets uh, for our farmers, ranchers, and producers. When we talk about new markets, we're talking about you know, taking full advantage of the climate challenge that we face. No question that climate change is making it uh, a, a challenge. No question that the United States has to lead in the effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and agriculture has a role to play. And I think a fairly significant and, and a very early role to play uh, in providing the United States early wins in that area. Uh, the, the president has a vision, uh, which I think American agriculture shares of getting to net zero emissions agri uh, and agriculture industry by the year 2050. Uh, to be able to do that, we have to provide a, a structure uh, in which farmers and ranchers and producers are incented and encouraged uh, to participate in climate smart agricultural practices uh, and benefit financially from doing so. Uh, and so what you're going to see over the course of the next uh, several months from the USDA uh, is a series of, of steps designed to promote climate smart agricultural practices, to promote regenerative agricultural practices, to, to promote better soil health, better water quality, and to provide financial incentives uh, for farmers to be able to take the, the chance, the risk that, and to purchase the equipment and the technologies that will enable them to significantly reduce their emissions connected to their operation, uh, hopefully gain some value added opportunities in the market, and at the same time uh, qualify for carbon markets uh, that currently exist and that will exist over the course of time. This is, uh, this is where new market, uh, new income streams can come into play. In addition, <laughs> conversion of agricultural waste, which we do a pretty good job of today, in terms of conversion into, into fuel and energy, but we need to expand that uh, to other, uh, other materials, other chemicals, other fabrics, and other fibers. We think there's a tremendous uh, untapped opportunity um, in terms of reducing emissions, reducing the greenhouse gas footprint of agriculture by conversion of agricultural waste into a variety of bio-based products. And we're looking forward to an exciting future that also will create jobs in rural communities. When we talk about uh, better markets, we're really talking about more transparent and more open markets and more competitive markets. Um, the reality is that we're seeing uh, a disconnect in the, in the market today. Um, our farmers who are producing beef, uh, pork, poultry uh, are uh, sometimes in a position where they are selling their animals at a loss, but the processing community, because of the consolidation that's taken place in that area, 
uh, of agriculture. The processing community has done quite well. We're seeing record profits, uh, record dividends being uh, being uh, I- issued by a number of these uh, processing facilities. And so we believe there needs to be greater transparency. Uh, we need uh, we believe there needs to be a strengthening of the Packers and Stockyards Act so that uh, so that farmers get a fair shake. But we also think that there needs to be more competition. We need more processing capacity in this country. It goes to resiliency as well. Uh, so we've created a five hundred million dollar resource uh, that we're going to use in the form of grants and loans and guaranteed loans uh, to be able to incent and encourage the location of additional processing capacity. We're also providing additional assistance to uh, existing small and, and mid-sized processing facilities uh, so that they can modernize their operations so that they could potentially expand their market reach uh, beyond what they're currently doing in-state uh, to an interstate opportunity. So when you look at the, the future of agriculture uh, in terms of traditional agriculture, uh, more new and better markets, critically important. Uh, we can talk about some of the other aspects of the future, uh, vertical uh, farming, uh, uh, you know, laboratory uh, production of, of, of food. Uh, I think there's an amazing opportunity ahead uh, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of challenges, but I think uh, it, it's going to be an exciting time for folks who are interested in agriculture. Let me stop there uh, because I know it's, uh, we, we want to spend a lot of time answering questions. So let me stop there and uh, take some questions. All right, terrific. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, again. Uh, my name is Mike Droke. I'm a partner in the Food, Beverages, and Agribusiness Industry Group at Dorsey, and, and we're very grateful for your participation. You know, as I was coming in today, I, I reside in our Seattle office and have worked on the West Coast my whole life, and I've seen really some major changes in the climate area, everything from a, a real heat snap during the harvest this year for just a couple of days, but it made a huge impact on the lives of people working in that industry and on the fruit and other things that were being picked and, uh, you know, obviously Hurricane Ida and the like. Uh, Can you talk uh, more specifically about the impacts that you're seeing across the country of climate change in the agriculture industry? Sure, there are a number of challenges. I was out in a uh, blackberry farm in Oregon uh, following that, uh, the heat dome. Uh, And it's uh, amazing to me that in a two day period, 60% 60% of that crop was destroyed. Uh, now, it, you know, it wasn't drought. It was the fact that there was intense heat uh, and those berries just couldn't take yeah, that intense heat. on the vine. Yeah, uh, and, and what a tragedy. And, and, and I think what it does is it raises the issue uh, of whether or not the systems that we have in place to provide help and assistance and to compensate farmers for losses occasioned by these climate-related, weather-related circumstances, whether they're adequate. Uh, The drought that is currently uh, impacting 95%, 95% of the Western U.S. is in a drought condition, and and uh, much of it is in severe uh, drought conditions. And some of these areas uh, that are in severe drought conditions have been uh, in that uh, situation, not for months, but literally for years. Uh, And as we look at the programs that we have, we have so many uh, relatively small programs that respond to uh, someone losing livestock uh, during uh, a hurricane like Ida. Um, someone basically having a a difficulty uh, finding feed, and so they have to purchase it from far away and and deferring the cost and and, and reducing the cost of that feed. We have programs like that, but they're relatively small. Uh, They're not particularly flexible. Uh, And it makes it very hard for us to be able to to deal with the consequences of a changing climate that are creating longer, more sustained uh, disasters that have greater financial impact and, and unique financial impact. Uh, so as we enter the 2023 Farm Bill discussions, I think one thing that we will be focusing on is how do you create the flexibility? How do you create this, the, the, the capacity for the Department of Agriculture to respond instantaneously uh, to these, to these uh, situations? I mean, for example, we've had forest fires and people think, well, you know, forest fires, burning trees, that's unfortunate. But if you're a, a, a wine, uh, if you're a vineyard uh, in California, uh, smoke damage is the thing you're most concerned about because it can essentially make it very difficult for you to produce red wine uh, because it uh, it obviously impacts the skins of the grape and you have to have the skins to be able to make red wine. So we're looking at ways in which we can understand the diversity of agriculture and now understand the, the impact of that diverse agriculture on a changing climate. Uh, and we're seeing it in the West. We're seeing it uh, with hurricanes. You know, the, the floods and the hurricanes are things that we're, we, we normally deal with. Um, uh, and so it's, it, it's fairly, you know, it's, it's, it's devastating for the people who are impacted by this, but it's fairly routine in terms of what we have to do. You, a disaster county is de- a declaration is declared for a, a county. 
that opens up disaster loans. It opens up additional assistance to folks. And people pretty much know what those programs are. But when you've got a drought that lasts for a couple of years, it's pretty tough. If you've got smoke damage uh, that you didn't anticipate ever, that's really tough. And we've seen insurance premiums uh, 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 go to the point where it's virtually impossible to afford uh, the insurance. So you can't, the private sector is not necessarily going to be able to provide the, the normal response to a disaster. So uh, critically important to understand uh, we're facing more severe storms, more severe circumstances, and that, that requires us to have more flexibility in the programs. You know, it's interesting you, you mentioned this because I was talking yesterday with some uh, business friends of mine at Marsh uh, Insurance Firm and uh, about the importance of being able to kind of predict uh, in the future uh, where areas are going to have certain types of events and various um, ways that the private sector is looking to do that. Can you talk to the USDA and its efforts to get information to farmers about what kinds of weather events might occur in their area or other kind of longer term changes that are anticipated? When I was uh, secretary before, we established uh, what we refer to as climate hubs. Uh, there, are, there are seven regional climate hubs uh, that basically cover the entire United States. There are three sub hubs uh, that focus on uh, very specific areas, forestry, uh, specialty crops, and uh, the Caribbean area. Uh, and these climate hubs essentially are uh, coordinated efforts between our Forest Service, uh, our NRCS uh, conservation folks, and, and our, uh, our researchers uh, to be able to take a look at and to assess the nature of climate and the changing climate to assess uh, the vulnerabilities for crop production and forestry in each of those regions, and then to provide information to landowners, to forest owners, to, to farmers and ranchers and producers steps that they can take to mitigate and to adapt uh, to that changing circumstance in their particular area. If you look long term, and I mean, you know, 30 years out, yeah. what you're looking at uh, is, is, the, is the weather changing to the point where some areas of the country that are used to growing certain things may not be able to grow what they used to grow, but they now be, may be able to grow a different crop. And so we need to be ahead of the curve on this. Uh, so that's why we've established these climate hubs, putting more resources into them. Uh, the president believes in, in, in research and putting more research resources into them so we can have an even finer, more granular uh, review of, of what's going on on the ground, and providing the kind of the expertise, the technical assistance, the, uh, the financial assistance to be able to respond to mitigate. We've just put forward a, a climate adaptation and mitigation report. And part of the focus of that report is on outreach, is on education, is on technical assistance, is on additional research in these areas. And so you're going to see uh, these climate hubs have an even more important role to play as time goes on. So it sounds like if uh, for regional farmers, at least, looking for the climate hub in their uh, geographic region is going to be essential and then seeking that report as you described. US yeah, USDA.gov. Uh, you just if you, you Google climate hubs, uh, you, it'll pop up with a map and it'll show you where uh, the climate hub is located in your particular region. Terrific. Which which kind of leads in a way to discuss discussing the infrastructure bill uh, that the Senate approved and is working its way through. Uh, how do you anticipate resources in the area of infrastructure will affect the food supply? Well, I would say there are a couple of things. First of all, uh, for farmers, ranchers, and producers, the ability to have access to broadband, high-speed broadband in rural areas and remote areas is critically important for them to have real-time information about markets, real-time information about how to operate their farms, ranches, and, and, and production areas. So the broadband piece of this is incredibly important. We've, uh, we've attempted uh, with fits and starts with small amounts of money, uh, relatively small amounts of money, to try to deal with this issue. And, and, and some reports would tell you that we've got 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the country covered. But the re reality is the uploads and download speeds are just so slow that, in fact, you do not have sufficient broadband access. And we have a program at USDA called Reconnect, where we're providing uh, grants and loans to uh, lo loans to, uh, to to basically step up, if you will, uh, the, the download and upload speeds of the existing facilities and also to try to provide resources for unserved areas. Uh, the uh, infrastructure bill contains a, I think, $65 billion, which is a very, very large uh, commitment. Uh, and I think an, enough money to essentially create more sufficient broadband access. So that's important. Secondly, one of the reasons why we are so um, uh, 
adapted exports of agricultural products is that we can get those products to market more efficiently and less expensively than some of our competitors, particularly uh, when we're talking about some of the row crop uh, commodities. Uh, we compete with Brazil and, and South American countries. Their infrastructure, their, their transportation infrastructure is not what it needs to be. So they, they, they add 25 cents or 30 cents or 40 cents a bushel uh, to their cost because of, uh, of, of getting it to market. Well, we used to have a fairly significant advantage when it came to infrastructure, but we've rested on our laurels uh, for 30 years. And we know there are bridges. We know there are roads. We know there are rail systems. We know there are inland water systems, uh, locks and dam systems. We know our ports are in dire need uh, of investment. So this infrastructure bill does create resources in every aspect of transportation that's going to enable us to continue to have that market edge, if you will, that competitive edge by being able to get product uh, potentially to market more quickly and more efficiently and therefore less expensively that allows us then to price our product in a way that's competitive. You know, our ports, uh, if you go and travel around the world, especially if you go to China, uh, you see other uh, significant export uh, countries, you will see that they have poured a lot of money into, into allowing their port structure to uh, accommodate large, large container ships. Uh, our ports uh, were structured for container ships of yesterday. China is developing ports for the container ships of tomorrow. Um, and we need to understand and appreciate we're in a competition here. Uh, and this infrastructure bill is critically important to get done uh, so that we have the investment in the transportation broadband in particular. You know, uh, people have not been in a modern tractor would be shocked at the level of technology that's involved. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit to the kind of crossover with climate. You used the phrase that I love, smart climate practices. Uh, how does that kind of correlate to the infrastructure bill? Well, uh, if you don't have broadband, then you can't take full advantage of precision agriculture. And if you can't take full advantage of precision agriculture, that is agriculture that allows you to understand and appreciate every acre of ground that you have and the unique characteristics of that acre uh, in terms of, of what kind of seed it needs, what kind of fertilizer it needs, how much water it needs, uh, what kind of herbicide it may need at any particular point in time. Every acre is different. Uh, and to the extent that you do a better job of managing your inputs, with precision, you obviously can improve your bottom line, but you also can potentially improve the health and the quality uh, of the soil. Uh, you can also uh, make sure that you continue to be productive, but you've got to have the broadband. You have to have the access to the internet to be able to, to have your tractor record the information, put it into a system and allow you uh, as a farmer to make informed judgments based on that data. Uh, so I think that, that that's critically important. Um, and absent that, uh, then that expensive tractor is, is just a tractor. Uh, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a decision maker for you. It's not a data collector. It's just a tractor, uh, as important as that is. Um, and I think farmers today, uh, particularly high-end farmers, large-scale uh, commodity producers, they really count uh, on, on, on that technology. Then, then there are the specialty crop producers that are looking at robotics, they're looking at, um, at, at ways in which technology can provide and assist them uh, in terms of helping their bottom line. Uh, and that in part is connected to, to, to the internet as well. Um, it also involves uh, additional resources for research and development. Um, and while it's not necessarily in the infrastructure bill, it is in the reconciliation bill that's going through the process as well, a fairly significant investment, a very rapid, significant uh, amount of money being placed into research uh, that would accelerate our ability to help create the technologies of the future that will allow uh, farmers to continue to be profitable. You know, one of the drivers I see in uh, the advent of some of that technology is really severe uh, issues about finding labor in the uh, agricultural industry. And uh, that obviously was really highlighted during COVID. Uh, can you talk about the um, pressure that agricultural employers are having in the area of labor and kind of what USDA is doing to address labor supply? Well, I got to tell you, this is one issue that just drives me nuts. <laughs> it drives me nuts because everybody in Washington, D.C. knows that our current immigration system generally, and certainly specifically as it relates to agricultural workers is broken. Now, when I say it's broken for agriculture, it's broken in this respect. The H-2A system, which basically allows 
uh, farm uh, operations to have temporary workforce uh, is very cumbersome, very difficult. It's limited in scope uh, and has many restrictions on it. Uh, and it, it's just not working as well as it needs to. Now it's expanded significantly uh, because the need for farm labor has expanded. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it is a system that drives the farmers and producers crazy. Uh, and it's not as convenient and it's not as easy to use as it should be. And it's not as flexible as it needs to be. On the farmer worker side, uh, you know, this is the tragedy of the current system. Uh, I was speaking to a farm worker the other day. He has been in the United States for over 20 years. Uh, he's making $13 an hour. Uh, a lot of that money goes back to his family in Mexico. Um, unfortunately, recently, uh, several of his family members passed away. He was unable to attend the funeral uh, because, uh, in fact, he hasn't been back to his home in over 20 years because he, he's concerned that if he goes back to Mexico, he won't be able to get back into the United States. So we don't have that capacity of these workers to be able to have access to their families, uh, who they are supporting and who they are working incredibly hard to support. So we have a broken system on both ends. Uh, and fortunately, um, when you have a broken system, normally what happens, as you well know, Mike, uh, uh, folks go to Congress and they say, we've got a problem, fix it. And then the members of Congress have to battle between each other, to try to figure out what the right fix is. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't get it done at all. Well, this time, uh, what happened was the producers, uh, particularly the Western growers, said, look, we, we need consistency here. We need stability. We need to know what the rules are. We need to know that the rules aren't going to change dramatically from year to year on wage levels and so forth. We, we, we need con consistency here. The farm worker community, the unions that represent these workers say, hey, you know, we need, we need a better understanding of working conditions and we need a, you know, we need a better system that allows our folks to travel. Uh, from place to place within the United States, and maybe occasionally to go home and come back without a bunch of hassles. And we need an H-2A system that basically creates the flexibility that, uh, that will allow us to have enough people uh, to work. So what these groups did, which is unusual, is they said, we're not going to ask Congress to solve this problem for us. We're going to solve it ourselves. We're going to get in a room. We're going to hash out a compromise. And, and they presented to Congress a, a, a bill which they refer to as the Farm Worker Modernization Act. And what it does is it essentially resolves the H-2A issue. Uh, it provides stability in terms of the wage levels, uh, increases and decreases that may occur from year to year, and provides a range so that, so that both the workers and the owners have some understanding of what that universe is going to be. It provides the ability of, of, of certified ag workers who can qualify that they've been here for a while, that they've worked for a long period of time, the ability to have legitimacy so they can travel back and forth between their countries so they can see their family. Uh, it creates better housing opportunities and asks USDA to provide the resources to improve uh, farm worker housing. In short, what it does is it helps to solve the problem we face today, which is th that we don't have enough workers and the workers we do have are scared to death on any given day. There may be a raid and that creates havoc and instability in the issue. It passed the House with a bipartisan vote. I think 30, 32 uh, Republicans voted with Democrats to pass it to the House. It's now in the Senate. Uh, for the first time in over 20 years, an agricultural secretary appeared before the Judiciary Committee to testify on behalf of that bill. That was me. Uh, it was an interesting experience. Um, <laughs> I imagine. Uh, well, uh, because I had, I had some senators who were quite supportive, some senators who were supportive that there was a tweak here or there. And then we had some senators who were just vehemently opposed, shouting uh, their opposition to this. Um, and, it, and it's the, the shouting of the opposition isn't really about the, the, the guts of the bill. It's about the politics of immigration, uh, which can be quite tricky. Uh, mm -hmm. And so our hope is um, that if there is an opportunity in the reconciliation bill that's currently being discussed in Congress to properly attach the Farm Worker Modernization Act to that reconciliation bill, we would have a fix of, uh, on this circumstance. So we're being, being very supportive, providing the technical assistance and being willing to do what we need to do in terms of housing and other ways in which we could support the implementation of that bill. But it, you know, it, shame on Congress if it can't figure out when parties come together and offer them, they, they, they've done all the heavy lifting here. They've done yeah, all the compromise. Stakeholder driven. Uh, yeah. Bill. It's, it, it's what we it's what we always said we want, right? We want bipartisanship. We want people to come together. We want people to compromise. Well, we've done that, right? And if if Congress can't figure out a way, if the Senate can't figure out a way to 
to basically honor that compromise and basically get the work done to pass it, then you know it's pretty discouraging uh, because why would you why why would you try to solve problems when you when you've got folks who who aren't going to be cooperative? So our hope is um, that this gets done, um, and we're working hard to make sure it does. You know, um, a bit of a segue because the labor is often a driver of it, but. I've seen so many changes in agricultural technology over literally the last five years, even trellising of trees and ways that uh, there's a machinery that can identify weeds in a field that literally zaps them uh, as uh, driving through the field, uh, et cetera. Do you, in what ways do you foresee agri uh, technology impacting food production in the US over the next, say, five to 10 years? Well, I think some large scale, uh, specialty crop producers are going to have to make a decision whether they continue to use human labor uh, to, uh, to, 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 to harvest or whether they're going to more mechanized mechanic, uh, mechanical uh, harvesting equipment. I mean, it is amazing to me that we literally have equipment today uh, that can, in a sense, smell fruit and know whether it's ripe or not and feel fruit, and know whether it's ripe or not. So it can be picked. It's pretty amazing stuff. Um, so I think you're going to see that. I think you're also going to see um, uh, elements of farming change uh, as we deal with shortages of water, as we deal with the uh, harsher climates in some areas, uh, some products it can actually be grown in vertical farms. Uh, we're seeing the, uh, you know, the onset of investors uh, basically taking a, a building in the middle of a city, uh, putting in uh, uh, lighting systems uh, and and uh, micronutrient uh, uh, systems that basically create trays and and of, of leafy greens um, that are highly 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 productive uh, and are in a controlled environment. Um, it's a you know sort of a, a real high end greenhouse, if you will. Um, and so we're going to I think we're going to see more of that uh, to complement. Um, and you know then then consumers are going to decide you know. Uh, this is fine, or this doesn't taste as good as uh, you know that uh, tomato that was grown outside. You know, but that gives consumer choice, um, and I think it also gives us the ability to respond to uh, ever increasing world populations and the food demands of ever increasing world populations with a variety of different ways to feed people and to grow the food and to, and to create the food. I, I don't see this as a as a circumstance where one will replace the other. I don't think that you're going to have vertical farming replace. Uh, what's happening in, in Salinas and in the Central Valley in California, I think you're going to continue to see that, but it's going to complement it. And so if there is a drought or if there is a, a, you know, a weather condition, climate condition that makes it hard for, the, for them to grow in a particular year, you have this uh, uh, more resilient system, if you will, because you have multiple ways, more diverse ways of being able to produce product. Um, and or so when varietals you that you couldn't have uh, fresh in that market, et cetera. No, that's right. And, and I mean, if you go into a grocery store today and compare that to the grocery store of 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 50 years ago, I mean, it is a phenomenal place. I mean, you're seeing thousands of new products being entered, entered into that market over the course of years. And, uh, you know, consumers have almost too much choice. You know, it's uh, like buying, a, uh, buying Triscuits is hard. You have to make sure you're buying the right one. Uh, because they all look alike, but you know, you want, do you want the one with pepper and salt or you want the one with oil and vinegar? What, you know, what do you, you don't want? You don't have to explain your choice when you get home. You know, no, that's you right. Can. You know, see, that's right. You know, it's, so you got the wrong Triscuit. So it's, it, so, but, but that's, that's what it's all about. It's about providing choice and, and making sure that we continue to do, do it in an efficient way, but a resilient way. I mean, our, our efficiency came at a price and we, we learned this during the pandemic, uh, the disruption that occurred and to today still still continues. Or cyber Supply crime as well. Well, cyber, that's another issue uh, that we obviously are deeply concerned about. Uh, and fortunately, our, our, our cyber uh, intelligence folks have put together a series of recommendations for businesses to harden their systems so they're not at the mercy of these folks who uh, weasel their way into the system and basically hold things hostage until payments are made. Uh, we saw that recently, obviously, with uh, JBS. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't have that. Uh, so we have to harden our systems. We've got structures and recommendations to do that. And hopefully, uh, uh, the food industry is embracing uh, that challenge and doing the right thing in terms of their cybersecurity. It seems part of the agricultural infrastructure and, and really 
as you see greater agri-technology, that becomes even more important, I would, I would think. No, that's right. Uh, you know, it used to be that uh, we were worried about people stealing data. Well, now we're worried about people disrupting processes. And that's a far more serious consequence. Because if you, and we found out during COVID, uh, while this wasn't cybersecurity, the fact is when, when uh, the processing uh, community didn't take COVID as seriously as they should have, and they saw hundreds of their workers ultimately get sick and unfortunately, tragically, some of them dying, which required them to shut down the plant for a period of time. Boy, that created a rippling effect that resulted in hog producers really getting stuck and in some cases having to euthanize their animals um, because there was no market. There was no place to take them. Right. And our, our, pro our processes are so efficient now that the hog has to be a particular size. And if it gets to be too big, it doesn't fit into the systems to process them. Uh, because of the efficiencies that we build into the system. So that's why it's important for us, I think, to have more processing capacity, more flexible processing capacity. So when there are going to be disruptions, and there will be from time to time, we're in a position that we don't see a significant market uh, uh, disruption to the point that farmers uh, are really get hurt. You, you mentioned earlier some changes in agriculture generally and, and placement of farms in urban settings and the like. And I know you recently visited Hastings, Minnesota to visit with a, a group of producers. Uh, what are you seeing about the kind of changing face of the agricultural producer and the markets that they can sell into? Well, it, it gets back to the need for local and regional food systems. And, and oftentimes what we find, many of those local and regional producers are beginning farmers, there are veterans coming back uh, from who lived in rural communities and want the opportunity to basically uh, get back into a rural setting, um, like the nurturing aspect of, uh, of, of farming, having uh, been in, in war and strife and conflict and wanting to have a, an alternative to that mindset. Uh, we've seen, obviously, a lot of, uh, of, of immigrant farm, uh, the, the Hmong population in Minnesota, an example. And essentially what we're looking at now is how do you, how do you create the ability of, of these folks to get into farming in a way that makes sense. Um, and we, as part of the American Rescue Plan, there is a provision that gives us the ability to look at this issue of technical assistance for these, for these folks. It looks at the issue of how do we help them get market access? How do we help them connect to a local school, to a farmer's market, to a, a hospital, or to an institutional purchaser of food, or to a local grocery store or a local restaurant who wants to be able to market the fact that they're selling locally produced product. Uh, how do we help that farmer uh, who may only have five or six acres get started? Uh, how do we provide the resource, the capital uh, for even a small uh, enterprise to buy the piece of equipment that's necessary or to be able to pay the rent for the land uh, for the first couple of years? How do we create risk management tools uh, for that really small producer? It's pretty simple to provide that corn farmer that's got a thousand acres down in Iowa crop insurance, but how do you how do you provide it for the person who's producing peppers uh, on five acres? Uh, and so we're looking at the entire entirety of this, uh, from the time you try to put the seed in the ground to the time that, that uh, it's consumed at, the, at someone's table. How do you create that structure, that system that enables us to have a more diverse agriculture? Uh, sizes of, you know, uh, farms of all sizes. Uh, different production methods. How do we help the organic industry, uh, which is a high value added opportunity? How do we help folks get into that business and transition? If you've got a traditional farm today and you want to transition to organic, you know, you've got to basically fundamentally change your operation over a two or three year period. And as you do, you don't really harvest the benefit of that change, but you do have to pay the expense associated with it. How do we help people transition who want to make that, uh, make that transition? Because there's a growing demand for organic, both here and, and a growing export opportunity as well. So a lot of challenges, but again, the challenges really represent a lot of opportunities because it's just an incredible time uh, in agriculture. And, and for those um, small, newer uh, farmers or the processors that wanna work with them, what's the best access point they would have to the USDA for the kinds of programs that you're talking about? How would they get well, to them? Yeah, I'd say a couple of things. Uh, you know, for for those of us who aren't particularly tech savvy, uh, going into the local FSA office, every county's got one. Uh, basically, saying, "Hey, I'm a beginning farmer. What can you do for me?" And those folks will probably say, "Well, we've got a, a micro loan program 
uh, for uh, for farmers, or we we've got an association with uh, extension um, at, at the local land grant university uh, that you can tie into to get uh, technical inf information. Uh, we are uh, we can talk to you, we can connect you to our rural development people who are helping, and our uh, agricultural marketing service folks who are helping to create the farmers market where you might be able to, to uh, have a booth and be able to begin to sell what you whatever it is you're growing, um, and so. Uh, there is a system. Uh, so the farm service office would be one way. Second way would be to, to, to uh, reach out to that local extension office um, and basically work with them because we, we have a partnership with the land grant universities. We help to fund and finance that extension service for that purpose. And if you're tech, tech savvy, um, you basically can go online. A lot of the information you're looking for is already online. Um, there are toolkits. There are uh, you know, ways in which USDA has uh, lots of information that's available online. So I'd say three ways for folks to get Terrific. connected. Terrific. I can see by the sun rising behind me in the West here from Seattle that we're approaching the end of our time. But I was curious, you know, the participants in this program really run a, a, a gamut from uh, farmers, large and small, uh, it, CEO of processing and co-ops uh, and the like, and uh, people in agrotechnology and investment banking in this industry. So uh, looking at it from a very broadest perspective, what are the two or three things that you'd like people to take away from this uh, program, from your perspective, seeing really worldwide agriculture and the US's unique role in that? What would be the, the few things that people should think about as, as they're going on uh, through the program and, and the rest of their day? Well, I'd say, first of all, uh there's a lot of conversation about climate and normally it's, uh, it, it's the impact the not negative impact of climate on, uh, on our activities. Uh, and I think it's important for us to understand there's an opportunity side. There are two sides of that coin. Uh, and we, we shouldn't be totally focused on how difficult this challenge is. We should be looking at the opportunity side because there are tremendous opportunities. I think, and then everyone in this program should be thinking, where do they fit into this notion of more new and better markets? And how can they basically provide more, you know, assistance and help, or take advantage of more new and better markets? There, there, there's a little something for everybody, uh, if you, if you will, in this discussion. Uh, you know, if you're a, if you're a commodity guy and you're growing a lot, you obviously are interested in exports. So you want to see what the the export market may look like. If you're a small producer, you're very interested in that local and regional food system. How can you help plug into what may exist, or how can you create one? in your area. Uh, if you are um, really a, a farmer concerned about the ability to meet the market where it is today and where it's going to be, there's no question consumers are requiring greater sustainability in the products that they purchase. You're going to have, there's a value added component there. How do you basically qualify, get up to that standard? How do you benefit from that value added? And how do you then potentially translate that into a, an additional revenue stream on a carbon market? What kind of help would you need? Um, from the USDA to be able to to uh, to do that, I think that's coming. So you want to keep an eye on that. And if you're somebody that just boy, you just wonder if you're getting a fair shake uh, at the market. Well, we we, we hear you, uh, and there may be an opportunity for existing processing to expand, or there may be an opportunity for a co-op to be de to develop its own processing capacity, so that you're not only benefiting from production, but you're also benefiting from processing. Uh, we're here at USDA to help uh, and provide assistance and help. You know, I, I love that reframing. I've often said that, you know, like uh, like every coin, there's heads and tails, but all the substances in between. And you've really helped reframe, I think, some of the challenges that, that agriculture faces into opportunities that agriculture can take advantage of in all respects. So with that, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for your wisdom for your service to our country, uh, for your uh, efforts on behalf of agriculture across the United States and even more broadly the world. Uh, you Thank bet. You. It's good to, be, good, to be, good to be with everybody today. Take care. Okay, back to the live program. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for your keynote address and your question and answer session with Mike Droke. Very informative. Uh, lots of information on the challenges we face, but also the opportunities uh, that are in front of us, both today and in the future. I particularly like his better, new, 
and, and more markets to improve farm income, uh, to strengthen our rural communities, which are really the backbone of this country. We all know that agriculture in the United States must and will change to keep America competitive and to feed the world. This is a photo courtesy of our own Jane Wilgus of her father on the family farm 75 years ago. Think about what farming looks like today as you look at this photo and think about how farming and agriculture will change over the next 10, 20, 40 years from now. Here to lead us in a discussion on the future of agriculture and those changes is a group of leaders in agriculture who will provide their vision for growth and the challenges that they see on the horizon. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Leah Ford, Senior Manager, Global Marketing and Communications with NatureWorks. John Rudinger of Rudinger Farms and board member of CRI and Gen X and a supervisory board member of Eurus. John Gingo, president of Applegate, which is part of the Hormel Foods family of companies. And Jay Debertine, president and CEO of CHS. Welcome everyone, and we look forward to your comments today. Our moderator for today's symposium discussion, Mike Cook, unfortunately was not able to join us. And so I will uh, try to fill Mike's uh, very large shoes. Okay, let's get started by asking each of our panelists to briefly describe the organization that they represent. I'd like to start with uh, Leah Ford. Hi, so I'm Leah Ford. Thank you so much for having NatureWorks here today. We, um, as a biopolymer producer, think a lot about the future of agriculture because essentially what we do is use an agricultural feedstock to fix CO2 into sugars that we can ferment in a process very similar to making beer or wine to produce uh, lactic acid that we turn into a polylactic acid biopolymer that we call NGO. So it's a raw material that can be used um, to create a wide variety of products from compostable cups to tea bags to filament for 3D printers. And you'll find this material in applications throughout North America, Europe, and Asia. Thank you. Uh, John Rudinger. Yeah, hi. Thanks uh, for having a, a dairyman uh, on the panel here, Michael. It's a very, a very nice pleasure to do that. Uh, my family and I uh, do dairy in Wisconsin. And uh, really part of our process here is working with cooperatives and uh, getting involved in other things. So on the other side of uh, my life, uh, I've uh, worked with uh, many companies uh, uh, within the, the cooperative system to gain uh, knowledge and to work actually over 30 years uh, working with GenX uh, in that uh, process. So uh, creating uh, governance, uh, business structures is important to sustainable agriculture and to sustainable cooperatives. So uh, really a pleasure of mine uh, to be here today as part of a local farming community and cooperatives. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, John. Um, John Gingo. Good morning um, and thank you for, uh, for the opportunity. Thank you for hosting this symposium. Um, great, great topics. So I'll speak on behalf of uh, Applegate, which is the, the company I work at. Uh, Applegate is the leading natural and organic food company or meat company, excuse me, in the United <clears throat> States. The company started in 1987. Uh, we've experienced tremendous growth over the past 30 plus years. Uh, you know, more and more consumers have turned to natural and organic foods. Uh, better for you foods, more sustainable foods. And so through that, we've grown quite a bit. Um, Applegate is a mission-based company. Uh, we refer to our mission publicly, changing the meat we eat. Uh, we continue to drive for change in the meat industry. And since 1987, we've been pioneers in the space of uh, no antibiotics, organic meat, uh, higher welfare, animal agriculture. Uh, we've also tackled processing and ingredients in processed meats, cleaning up some of the the most maligned foods in the industry, like the hot dog. Uh, today at Applegate, we sell uh, a range of convenient, um, you know, delicious foods for the household. So from bacon and sausage to deli meats, uh, breaded chicken products like that. Um, 
you can find our products in uh, in retail outlets like uh, Whole Foods or Target or Walmart and, and everywhere in between. Um, and we do, because we have a range of products, we also have a range of uh, agricultural assistance behind that. We, we sell chicken, we sell turkey, we sell beef, uh, and we sell pork. Um, in 2015, we were acquired by Hormel Foods, uh, who has been a, a great supportive parent company for us, but we do continue to operate as a standalone subsidiary within Hormel Foods. We continue to progress our mission uh, forward and continue to work on new pathways to improve the system, including uh, regenerative agriculture. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity today. Thank you, John. Uh, Jay Debertine. Well, thank you and good morning to everyone. And, and thanks to Dorsey for hosting this uh, symposium, a, a topic I, I think just with a lot of excitement, a lot of, uh, a lot of enthusiasm, uh, particularly right now. <clears throat> CHS, largest cooperative in North America. Uh, the business model, very straightforward. Uh, we, we provide the goods and services to plant an acre of ground. Um, and we provide the goods and services as that acre of ground matures. And then uh, as harvest comes, we come back in and buy those, uh, those grains that are produced from that acre ground. With those grains, we process some of it ourselves. We process some of it in partnership with others and the rest we ship to customers around the world. Uh, and so we are in many aspects th that the secretary spoke to. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'd like to start the uh, discussion um, uh, with uh, Leah Ford uh, from NatureWorks, um, you know, the secretary uh, described his strategy of improving uh, farm income as uh, developing more new and better markets. As a biotechnology company, what is NatureWorks strategy of developing more new and better markets for its bioproducts? Absolutely. I think the whole big idea behind NatureWorks is to create a new market for materials. So we've been in the business of producing our biopolymer at commercial scale since about 2002 when our plant opened. And our plant is located in Blair, Nebraska, just a little bit north of Omaha. And comparatively, most of the major plastics in the world were introduced between the 1930s and the 1960s. I think linear low density polyethylene was probably the last one in the mid 70s. So to think about this idea where we were going to turn an agricultural feedstock into a bioplastic that we could sell globally and try to change markets in the early 2000s really was a big, crazy idea. And when we came to market, we had to not only know how to make our polymer and how to make it well, but also teach the world what they could do with it. The world was very happy with the plastics and fibers that they had. It made very nice cups. But what we saw and what we hope the long-term vision would be is that we would need materials with a lower carbon footprint. We'd need materials that when it's used in food packaging, it could be compostable. That we would need all of these sustainability benefits alongside a cup that works really well or a tea bag that does exactly what you expect a tea bag to do. But you would need to pair that with, um, like I said, low carbon footprint and less energy use. So, just bringing our product to market was definitely uh, new. And to this day, we are still the largest commercial scale producer of polylactic acid biopolymer globally. And since 2017, we've really seen the market turn around a bit. We've seen um, a lot of legislation passed both in North America and Europe, looking at single use plastics. We've seen consumers demand better solutions from brand owners and retailers looking for more sustainable materials. and We've seen a lot of um, NGOs and frameworks, things like the circular economy, really trying to help us address both climate change and plastics that are out on the market. And all of those things coming together have created a moment of unprecedented demand for bio-based materials. And so it's a really exciting time where we're seeing not just our initial ideas on the market come to fruition, but all of these new ideas and new markets open up. We now are really trying to find places where these bio-based materials can have the most impact. So both in terms of sustainability and in terms of performance. I know I mentioned food packaging and that's a really great example because when you have a container that has food in it, whether it's a coffee capsule, a tea bag, or um, some serviceware, that plastic can't be recycled because it's contaminated with food. 
And you really want to be able to address from a waste perspective, both the packaging and what do you do with that extra food? Food breaking down in landfills in the U.S. is the third largest source of methane emissions. And the more we can keep food waste out of landfills, the better impact we're going to have on uh, climate targets. So we really see food packaging as a market that is just starting to um, take off at even larger scales so that we can address not just plastics and waste, but food waste um, and kind of bring it all together in a really nice uh, circular way. A, a little, a, a little ahead of ahead of your time in a way, because as the secretary described, new markets. Uh, he talked about you know net zero emissions in agriculture by 2050, and I think NatureWorks is a is a great example of the opportunities uh, that are out there for agriculture um, in developing these these new markets. Um, just a follow-up question, Leah. How uh, how does NatureWorks source its feedstock? Um, I understand you've just announced a, a, a new plant uh, overseas, but in at its uh, uh, Blair, Nebraska facility, how do you source your feedstock? Absolutely. So right now we use uh, Yellow Dent Number Two field corn that's grown within 50 miles of our facility in Blair, Nebraska, and. Industrial corn in the US is obviously grown for a lot of different end uses from gluten feed, gluten meal, corn oil. And what NatureWorks uses is a starch component of a corn kernel to be able to use for our fermentation process. And what's interesting is, you know, our process is not necessarily dependent on corn specifically, but on a locally abundant source of sugar. Because we're selling into markets looking towards sustainability, the type of feedstock we use, how it's grown, and its impact on the environment is critically important to our supply chain, the brand owners, the retailers, and the consumers that are pulling these products through. So we not only source locally to our facility in Blair, but we've also been working on a program where all of the farms that we source from are going to be certified as complying with certain sustainable agricultural practices. So we use a certification called ISCC Plus that ensures that all of the farms that are supplying to our facility are adhering to certain principles around both environmental sustainability, so practices like best practices for pesticide use, no-till, um, practices that protect biodiversity and soil health, as well as social sustainability practices, so fair labor practices, um, wages, et cetera. Because we want to make sure that you know, no matter where we're getting our feedstock from or how it's coming through, we're doing the best we can to help make sure that the agricultural system is doing the right thing, both by the people and by the environment. Oh, thank you. I, I, again, um, uh, we, we start with renewable and uh, that's, that's what agriculture is all about. And, and, and as we move towards sustainable and to provide the types of feedstocks for these new products, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, for agriculture. So thank you. Um, I want to I want to follow up on the more new and better markets. And uh, John uh, Gingo, uh, what is Applegate's vision and goals uh, for growing, processing, and distributing it, its food products uh, globally? And and what do you see as the top two or three challenges or concerns in uh, your organization uh, to achieve those goals? Um. You know, Applegate uh, today is, we're currently only available in, in the United States, but we do operate globally um, as a company through our sourcing and also as a part of a global branded food company with, with Hormel. And I think that gives us a unique perspective on, on the future of agriculture. So as I said earlier, our mission of changing the meat we eat is all about that look ahead, right? It's all about future opportunities. So I was very uh, excited, frankly, to hear the secretary talk about new markets. Uh, you know, that's a big that's a big opportunity for us and how we think about the food system. Um, our vision is really about bringing the food system back into balance. Um, so, as a as a progressive or let's say one of the voices that's out there talking progressively for meat, that also means animal agriculture and advocating for animal agriculture being a vital part of the human experience, a vital part of a healthy planet and a healthy system. And so, you know, if you look at the challenges, we've reached, I would say, the cliff on a number of topics, antibiotics being one, um, and antibiotic resistance. 
soil erosion being two, climate change being three. And the question now is, you know, how do we avoid falling off the edge of that cliff? And uh, regenerative agriculture is something that we continue to believe uh, is a big answer to a lot of those issues. So uh, when I heard the secretary talk about climate smart agriculture, and regenerative agriculture, part of the three-pronged strategy of more, new, and better, that really fits quite well with our goal to take regenerative agriculture from niche to I'll call it norm, niche to norm or niche to mainstream, mm -hmm. uh, and show people that animals can actually have a positive impact, positive impact on the land. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing coming from our lens is, you know, making one of the most familiar products, sort of the iconic products uh, in the U.S., uh, a hot dog from verified regeneratively sourced beef, right? That's, that's one of the things we're working on right now. The challenge is, you know, these are paradigm shifts. There's a supply chain shift that needs to happen. How do we reimagine supply chains? There's also a storytelling or a narrative shift. How do we flip the prevailing narrative that animals are the problem and a fundamental change? Um, you know, and how do we approach problem solving really is what we're talking about. So on the supply chain side of things, that's been, I would say, Applegate's expertise over time is building new and specialized supply chains, working with a lot of partners to do that. Uh, we did it with antibiotics and so no antibiotic uh, practice in raising animals. And there were many people back in the day who said that couldn't be done. It couldn't be, it couldn't be made into a viable economic business. And in fact, now uh, animals raised without antibiotics and the meat that comes from those animals is a multi-billion dollar market and industry. Um, as for flipping the, the narrative, uh, and transforming the way we think about the problem, it's tougher. There's a lot of noise out there right, right now uh, about being the problem, about animal agriculture being the problem. And, you know, it's sort of the way we're wired. There's a lot going on in the world. As humans, we like to go to sort of the one-stop shop, the one-stop solution. So the plant-based meat companies, for example, um, you know, they've made huge progress in terms of mimicking the taste and texture of real meat. Uh, and they're saying it's a silver bullet, right? That's kind of the narrative that's out there that the plant-based alternatives are a silver bullet. Just delete meat and all of our problems will be will be gone and solved. And to me, that's not very realistic. Uh, you know, we need to get people to think um, more holistically, to think differently, not swing from one extreme to the other, but to really educate about the fact that, um, you know, we, the, ter the term we use is not the cow, it's the how, right? You have to get underneath that and really understand the system behind what you're doing. So um, I, I come back to a critical point that uh, the secretary mentioned in terms of consumer choice. And what gives me optimism for the future that we can drive some of these changes is consumers are changing. Their, their needs are changing, their desires are changing. So I have a statistic here, which is when you think about the next generation of consumers, uh, there's a recent study done in the past several months by a company called BDMG, who we work with a branding consultancy who specializes in regenerative they found that 59% of young people under the age of 30 uh, often or always consider the responsibility of a brand when they choose food and drinks, right? The younger consumers are there. Uh, to me, as a, as, a, as a branded company, that's a big part of it. That connection between the consumer and the brand is going to help us drive the change and ultimately overcome the challenges. Okay. Thank you. Know, uh... Uh, uh, as we uh, put together the panel, we had a, a lot of questions uh, coming in exactly what is regenerative agriculture or uh, more specifically to Applegate, regener regeneratively uh, sourced uh, uh, meat. Um, can you expand on that a little bit, John? Are you, uh, you mentioned, it, so it's, it, is regenerative sourced uh, meat, uh, no antibiotics, is it sustainable practices by your suppliers? Um, uh, what, what, uh, what, what is your definition, I guess, of regeneratively sourced meat? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question and certainly uh, something we've been, we've been working on and looking at for quite some time and something regenerative agriculture percolating in the progressive agriculture circles, right? So, um, at the base, I would say, in terms of understanding what it is, from my point of view and our point of view, it's about employing practices in agriculture that help build soil health and build biodiversity and help actually sequester carbon rather than uh, extractive practices that deplete soil, right? That's the fundamental kind of science or notion behind it. 
um, and moving to a more holistic system that's more in balance with nature. So if you look at ranchers and farmers that are working with animals and plants in harmony, right, to create positive impact. So, you know, where animals are out on land, out on pasture, where they're turning and churning the soil and the land, where they're fertilizing the land and helping, the animals are actually helping to create better, healthier soil, soil that's more full of life, land that's more full of life, more biodiverse, but also more able to retain water, increasing the water retention capability and the carbon sequestration capability of that land. That's really what's at the heart of it. So when we say regeneratively sourced beef, uh, we say that because we may make a hot dog from that beef. It's not the hot dog that's regenerating the land, right? It's the, it's the practices of adaptive holistic grazing of the cattle on the land and the land is what's regenerating. So that's how we think about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, you see, when you first hear that term, you're think I'm thinking something that's recreated, but uh, uh, that makes sense, and, and appreciate you uh, expanding on that. Um, Jay, I really want to stay on the more, better, uh, new markets strategy to improve uh, farm income, strengthen our rural communities, and uh, uh, bring more money back back to the country. As one of the leading uh, suppliers of inputs to farmers, ranchers in North America, the leading, uh, as well as uh, marketing and, and processing their products, what is CHS's strategy on um, uh, growing, processing, and, and distributing our food globally? So I think you know I I I think the secretary makes a great point uh, that there's really going to be opportunities for processing crops further in the U.S. and more of the of, of the processing at CHS we're expanding our own processing plants uh, as as we speak and and I think you've seen uh, more processing plants announced to be built um, you know because frankly the barriers to entry are are pretty low to be able to uh, to build processing. Uh, and people are looking at the opportunities that the secretary spoke to, as well as, as really some new developments in the market. And I think that's what uh, is interesting at this point in time is, um, you know, building processing generally uh, is, is good for farmers. It gives farmers more options. Uh, it generally lifts the basis in the territory which these processing plants are built. Uh, so, um, you know, farmers like like to see it built. They um, they like to see the options that they they have from having additional processing. I think the processors going forward, um, you know, really frankly have to ensure that they've built size and scale so that they can compete long term um, because these are long term investments. But there's some some particular issues going on right now that are are are, are a bit unique to, to today's circumstances. Uh, and I'll pick on soybean uh, oil for, for 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 the example. Soybean oil generally in processing has been driven by a couple of factors. One is what's going on in animal production, hogs in particular, uh, and what's going on food demands and for soybean oil in particular. Today's environment's got a new dynamic, and then a new dynamic of of new demands coming from uh, diesel fuel, frankly, uh, and renewable diesel fuel, which is putting a huge new demand on soybean oil. Um, and the industry is really being a bit shocked by the amount of demand coming at it. I think the food industry is quickly waking up to uh, a new market dynamic that's coming from this, you know, this this role that, that soybean oil is going to have in renewable diesel. Um, soybean oil has always had a bit of a of, of a role within within renewables, but um, but it's growing by leaps and bounds uh, as we speak. In fact, you've seen some oil companies really start to get into the crush business, which is, you know, this 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 is these are great new developments that. Um, that, that, that people are going to be adapting to. Uh, I think the result of this is going to be, though, that we have to keep, it, keep in mind that, that all market impacts have effects. Um, and the buyers for soybeans to take around the world, those buyers are still there. Uh, and they're going to be still there. And because they have their own populations to feed. So uh, I look at it as a positive for the farmer. Uh, but I think it's going to be some really additional dynamics coming uh, coming coming at these markets. 
And I think the third point that I raised within the processing side is, is we also have to remember that the products we talk about are, are global products. So the same market forces, the same market signals that are being given to a US producer, a US processor, a US farmer, many times are in front of the Brazilian farmer, the Brazilian processor, or the Ukrainian farmer and the Ukrainian processor. Uh, and so I just think that we have to think about you know, our, our business with that global side um, because uh, the, 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 the movements of goods and services across the world um, we just have to count on the fact that that needs to be, that needs to have good movement. It's good for the U.S. farmer when, 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 when those products and goods can trade, uh, trade fairly, and, uh, and that's going to have some effects. Okay, so, so you've, you've identified uh, a couple of the challenges. I, you know, it's, it sounds like you know, one, one of the strategies that's, that's taking place right now at CHS is to expand your processing uh capacities um uh, what 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 other uh challenges do you see uh for example on the input side uh in your business as you um, address kind of the decarbonizing uh, world out there um, yeah, so uh, challenges I, or concerns uh, for chs yeah i think uh well i i mean i i, I kind of echo the secretary's uh point i, I mean i'll I'll, I'll start with the with the mindset that I think we have to have, which is which is um, <clears throat> the country is going to be moving in this direction, and uh, and it's going to be up and to the right. Now it may not be at a linear pace, and it may go faster and slower at at times, but it is moving that direction. So if there's one word that 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 we at CHS uh, focus on, and we, we we talk about a great deal is one better have the mindset of being able to adapt. Um, and if, 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 if an approach would be to push back, to be defensive, to argue against, if um, that, that I think is a, is a strategy when it comes to inputs going into the land or the land um, management, uh, I think it's gonna be better to have an approach of adapting and looking for the opportunities uh, and, as opposed to being defensive and pushing back. Now, I think the 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 Michael the the the, the needle to be threaded here, though, is there are impacts that come from some of these decisions that need to be up on top of the table. Putting more land into no-till may, in some circumstances, have a yield impact. For example, um, so the a proper question is. How do we deal with that yield impact? How is that farmer made whole or compensated for that yield impact? And maybe the answer will be, well, it'll be done in the price of the carbon or, or the revenue to the acre. Maybe that's the case. But those kinds of questions also need to be put up on top of the table. And then the, the, the issue with the needle and the thread is we cannot be, as an agricultural industry, come across as defensive when we raise those kinds of points. It's, it's, it's only to be that no, in, you know, d discussions need to have facts on the table. And so how do we think about things like that as an example, um, but, but working towards a solution and working towards um, getting the benefits that, that I think agriculture can have from these climate um, opportunities. And, um, but I, I just think it's, 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 it's just gonna be a, a, a terribly interesting time with great opportunities, but we also have to make sure that we do it in kind of an intellectually honest way and, and have these things up on top of the table. I, mean, I, it, uh, I, I really like your, your comments on, on adaptive, uh, uh, thoughtful approach to uh, the opportunities out there because it is the world that we live in. And um, certainly I know of uh, uh, no better stewards of the land than farmers who have been uh, uh, farming that land for for generations. So I think it's it's about, as you say, have putting it on the table, uh, having those conversations, uh, you know, not being defensive and and looking forward for the opportunities that are out there uh, in these in these new markets and in this uh, decarbonizing 
global uh, economy uh, that right, we're Michael. operating in. Absolutely so right. thank, thank you for that. Um, one of my favorite comments uh, of, of Mike Cook as we were uh, talking about the symposium discussion is the best partnerships can't be explained. And that he was referring to a groundbreaking joint venture uh, 40 years ago uh, to form a leading agronomy company uh, that I had the pleasure of, of working with uh, in the U.S. that was outlined on a napkin. John Rudiger, in today's world of global competition and the ever-increasing need for capital uh, to grow your business and to maintain your, your market share and your competitive advantage, what do you see as the keys for innovative structures to enable local agricultural organizations uh, to compete and succeed in today's world? That's a great question, Michael. In order to, to uh, work within the local environment, I think you have to look beyond local a little bit and uh, see what you can do uh, with a number of agriculture communities that you work with. As an example, uh, with uh, GenX Cooperative here uh, in, uh, in, in discussion in markets and, and uh, so on around the world and what you need to do to, uh, to be able to compete and, and to look at uh, uh, things. So uh, we need to work together to, uh, to bring value uh, to the producer on the producer level and to, uh, to uh, see uh, what we can use uh, uh, to gain that, uh, that part. So, you know, the, if you're looking at what is the vision of uh, the future of agriculture and uh, what can a local cooperative in the genetics world uh, offer uh, uh, to uh, livestock producers, I think you need to look at some of the industry consolidations that have taken place uh, over time uh, and to uh, work at increasing some dominance in, in the world markets. As an example, uh, uh, in uh, the cooperative market here uh, within uh, GenX and uh, over 25 years ago, we formed a Cooperative Resources International, a good model uh, to take and, and to look at what can you do for bringing organizations together to better serve. And I think that's part of what your question is. And, uh, you know, looking at a genetics company and, an, and a, uh, a livestock or a uh, uh, egg source is a records uh, company partnering uh, with that. And then we really took that uh, one step further here uh, in 2018 when we formed Eurus. And that's really uh, another example of what you're doing in consolidating uh, in the marketplace, uh, making uh, sure that uh, cooperative ideals and principles, the membership things, all of those things flow through uh, within uh, here to uh, uh, help local producers uh, remain more sustainable uh, with that. So I think consolidating, growing the markets, working within uh, agriculture commodities uh, uh, really help us uh, to uh, bring things forward. Well, uh, John, as you mentioned, uh, you're a dairy farmer. And um, as we were planning this uh, uh, Future of Agriculture Roundtable, um, I said, uh, we, we can't have a Future of Agriculture Roundtable without a farmer. Um, so I certainly appreciate your perspective. I also, um, uh, when I think about innovative structures uh, in agriculture, I, I do think of, of CRI, you know, the first uh, cooperative holding company. I think of uh, the formation of Eurus, uh, a, a private uh, 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 cooperative partnership to expand markets and uh, increase access to capital. What, what do you see, John, as maybe some of the weaknesses and, and or pitfalls and challenges you know, as you in your career in leading cooperatives, you know, evaluate these um, innovative structures. What 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 have you seen, and and maybe what kind of um, uh, uh, to dos or watch out fors could you um, uh, provide our participants 
uh, with some some of your uh, wisdom uh, over the past 30 years? Yeah, there's uh, there are challenges uh, like uh, we all know when you put uh, groups together and I I think part of the uh, it's the governance challenge, the diversity of the memberships that you're trying to bring together. And uh, a good example on uh, in the livestock industry, you have a number of herd sizes, a lot of different uh, size uh, dairy and beef businesses. And so when you're looking at governance things and, and uh, the diversity within your membership, uh, you know, many producers feel that uh, well, gee, the more the larger I am, the more I spend. Uh, we need to have a little higher input uh, on governance. A good example uh, there is uh, at uh, Genix, we have over around 7,500 members, and 600 of those members generate two thirds of the income in the U.S. revenue, and uh, that's uh, that's huge. And so, obviously, those folks would really like to have a bigger seat at the table, so to speak, but. You know, in the cooperative business, we are a one member, one vote system. So how do we really try to work uh, as an organization uh, to uh, keep that relevant and to keep uh, uh, producers uh, involved in trying to uh, uh, get to the vision that we have of a, a large global business that uh, maybe is one size for all, but we have to figure out what things we can do uh, to get those uh, 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 aspects of, of governance and of membership needs all rolled into what can we do uh, to, uh, to work within each, each sector. Um, just, you know, we, we really worked hard on that this past year with, uh, with Ingenix. And maybe just a little bit of an example, Michael, to alternative cooperative structures that we can do with membership that I think uh, would help uh, other folks look at their membership base and what they would need to do uh, into the future. And so at, at GenX, we introduced the four tier system uh, based on revenue spent and the percent of business and, and uh, the number of members. So really the percentages will stay the same from year to year, revenues uh, ranges will change. But when we're looking at that tier system, we're placing our directors uh, within the tiers on with the amount of money that they do spend uh, within the cooperative. So it really allows us to match uh, the membership uh, to the to the directors, to the board, to the management teams, and really monitor uh, what the visions are, similar values, veer, views, desires, challenges. You know, you can create a lot of things when you try to put like-minded people uh, together. So I think, you know, coming back to creating the business plans more specifically for the segments, I think will be very helpful uh, domestically here within the Genix Cooperative and, and within Eurus. I think that'll really help us as we move into the international side of uh, cooperative development. Uh, that's gonna be huge for us uh, into the future. Uh, we have a very good domestic base and, uh, and a lot of great international partners uh, that we work with, over 88 countries around the world that, that we work in. And so what can we do as a cooperative to set up and to start uh, internationally and in taking our, our governance uh, structure locally here and move it uh, forward? Thank you. Um... Uh, uh, Jay, uh, uh, I'm a little off script here, but I, I want to just touch on this, um, uh, you know, innovative structure in a, in a way because uh, obviously CHS, as you as you said, uh, largest uh, cooperative in North America. Um, uh, do you see changes in your organization uh, in terms of of governance and? And just, um, uh, I guess, dealing maybe with a, a direct membership, uh, local supply co-op co membership. Uh, how, how has that evolved uh, over the years? And, and where do you see that uh, going forward to kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, address the, the idea that you've got a very diverse uh, membership and, and producer size uh, within the CHS uh, membership? 
Well, I mean, everything you said, Michael, is, 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 is correct. We do have diversity within our membership. Uh, we, uh, we operate on a global basis. Uh, so that means we're, we're buying uh, around the world and selling uh, around the world. And, um, but, when I, but I think about specifically on the co-op uh, structures, I think, I think we have to have a mindset that as agriculture, we op need to operate as an, as an efficient platform as, as, as is possible uh, to, com to compete with those around the world and, uh, and to earn the business from customers around the world. So I think there's um, just terrific opportunities for cooperatives, whether they be locally owned or direct uh, owners into a company like CHS uh, to look for those synergies and to operate as close as we can together uh, to, um, to drive cost and drive inefficiency out of, out of the supply chains and out of the systems. Uh, and specifically the way um, I, I bring that home uh, in, in, in our case, um, we very much um, look for the communication and the steps involved when we have a ship in berth uh, in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, ready to load, that time frame, that opportunity, we bring right back to a farmer, say, in North Dakota, about bringing their grain to town when we're filling that train, and that train is, is targeted for that boat that's coming into berth. And that kind of efficiency that comes uh, really leads to, I think, uh, the United States' ability to compete around, around the world. Um, now we do that directly with farmers. We do that uh, directly with, with 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 local cooperatives, and um, and I, I just uh, I think those are the steps that allow us, you know, to to compete. And uh, and and I just you know I, I I think that there's opportunities for us to work closer and with more efficiency, uh, regardless of locally owned structures or direct producers. Um, and, and, and frankly, if we don't focus on that e efficiency, uh, I think those companies or those countries that do um, will be the winners. And, I, and, I, and I'm, not, um, I, I'm not gonna accept that. I think that we can, we, 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 we can win that game. Um, uh, agreed. Uh, uh, great points because uh, I mean, efficiency on the supply side and on the marketing side for American agricultural producers is key, obviously, to keeping us competitive. So appreciate your comments there. Um, Leah, we, we spoke last night briefly about the fact that uh, NatureWorks is a joint venture between Cargill and PTT Global Chemical. Um, I, I thought it was appropriate to have you talk a little bit uh, because uh, on innovative structures and on seeking efficiencies in your um, in your joint ventures uh, because even you know frankly uh, let's face it I mean a, a company the size of Cargill the you know the world's largest uh, private uh, corporation I believe um, still seeks joint venture partners uh, to you know to to further its uh, its business model and so would, could you speak a little bit on some of the thought process and, and strategies uh, behind uh, NatureWorks uh, and its uh, joint venture uh, partners over the years? Sure, absolutely. So initially the idea for NatureWorks started as a Cargill research project uh, back in 1989, looking for additional uses of sugar. But when they wanted to bring that to commercial scale, Cargill's expertise obviously is in feedstocks and fermentation. So NatureWorks actually began as a joint venture between Cargill and Dow Chemical, where Cargill could work on feedstocks and fermentation. And Dow obviously is a global expert in polymers and plastics and how to make things from those plastics. So that joint venture is what led to the building of our plant in Blair. It's really what started us on the path to commercial scale production. Um, fast forward to now where we're a joint venture between Cargill and PTTGC, and that partnership is really what's gonna support us as we begin the next phase of our global expansion. So 
we just a few weeks ago announced that next year we're going to begin construction on our second manufacturing facility, which is really exciting for us. Um, that's going to be located just north of Bangkok in Thailand. Um, and PTTGC is a Thai company. And we've seen in Asia the markets for plastics and sustainable materials really grow, driven by consumer demand, government legislation, climate change, and um, sustainability are driving the market as much there as anywhere else. And so being able to manufacture in Thailand will give us better access to those markets. And also in Thailand, we have access to a locally abundant source of sugars in sugarcane. So we are, that joint venture is really gonna set us on this path to grow because right now in biomaterials, it's all about scale. So all the bioplastics in the world, not just ours, but all the materials out there compared to oil-based plastics, about 1% of the market size, if we've made it to 1% yet. So it's a really small market, but the demand has completely outstripped um, all of our expectations. So we are looking to scale and scale globally and, and everyone in this market really is. Thank you. Well, I uh, appreciate the panelist comments. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, uh, the American uh, uh, farmer, rancher, and producer uh, must focus on efficiencies in both the supply side and, and marketing of, of their products. Um, so thank you for your comments. I want to switch gears a little bit for the panel. Um, one of the topics touched on by the secretary was ag tech. And uh, John, uh, I wanted to start with you, John Rudinger. Uh, as a dairy producer, um, what do you see, you know, in terms of robotics or uh, uh, ag tech down at the ground level at, at your farm? I mean, is that is that going to be critical uh, to your operation to ensure, it, you know, the, the, the farm operation continues for generations or um, how do you view ag tech? Yeah, that is uh, something that is viewed very highly, Michael. Uh, technology is, is something that really drives our business. And uh, personally, I'm glad my son-in-law is uh, back on the farm with us because he's, uh, he's more technology savvy than I am and uh, really has grabbed onto that technology. A good example is the uh, uh, rumination and heat detection system that we put in into our dairy herd. And uh, we have on time, real time uh, data points being generated to uh, say if our livestock are healthy, we can predict maybe when they're needing some extra care. We can predict uh, to within the hour when we need to inseminate uh, those animals to get the highest pregnancy rate. So I think technology is really here uh, to help us. We're, in fact, we're working with another company to. Uh, to take all the data points that we have uh, in our feeding system, in uh, taking some climate uh, weather uh, as, uh, events that, that affect when you feed livestock and you're putting all those uh, in expensive ingredients into a TMR and uh, feeding them to the cattle and uh, timing on, on feeding and all those things we're working to with, through technology data points to uh, get uh, better and, and more accurate in feed efficiency within our livestock. And then on the agronomy side, uh, our dairy uh, works uh, with a, a young uh, agronomist uh, farming family. We buy our grains and they plant our corn for us. And, and this guy has uh, got like six computer screens in his tractor when he's planting the corn and everything is being looked at on the agronomy side on uh, fertilizer placement, all of those things. So yeah, every aspect Good. really is here at, for technology, Michael, it okay. is here. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, it, 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 sound, it really illustrates the need for the, uh, uh, for the broadband um, uh, internet, uh, high speed internet uh, access uh, to oh, farmers, exactly. ranchers and producers. Uh, that's needed to uh, to to do the precision agriculture and and perform. So I think that's a it's a very important part of the infrastructure bill. I think to to move agriculture forward. Um, Jay on the on the on the on the CHS side, 
for for ag tech uh what what kind of plans does chs have or strategies to uh i guess really uh, uh implement or provide that uh some of those uh, services uh, to your uh farmers and and ranchers yeah so uh so this egg, the egg tech space hugely exciting and uh and it's i think it's it's good for agriculture that frankly uh, much of technology has discovered egg, uh, and I think that's good, good for us, and it's going to provide uh, great opportunities. As a company at CHS, we're we're going to have more to say about this um, la later this year. But it's a it's a hugely exciting space for us. We've already made investments into new technology. We have uh, some of our uh, proving grounds um, being used right now to test this technology. Um, because we think we have a lot to offer the technology companies in terms of direct access through local cooperatives or directly to acres to be able to test it and, uh, and, and, and to prove it. I mean, I agree with most with the, with the points that John raised. So I, I won't, I won't repeat some of those, uh, applications of that new technology, um, in the agronomic space, uh, and, and, and fertilizer space. I think the, the point that I would raise in addition to what John mentioned is I think this technology really has opportunities when it, when it looks to labor related issues. Uh, and because that is an issue, the secretary spoke to it uh, and maybe, you know, maybe we'll see some movement in the government side to, to help with some of the issues that we face around labor. But this technology that can help farmers uh, and agriculture uh, in ways that uh, that if, that impact labor, I think, are going to be really well received. There's lots of challenges that go with it, um, but it is something that I think we really, if you, you think of, um, you know, driverless uh, sprayers and uh, and and technology that's got a lot of issues ahead of it, but also has got some real concerns with our ability to source um, labor for 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 what we need. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an open, it's an open frontier. Um, there's, there's already been great technology that's been, uh, developed and applied in particularly the, the seed and the crop protection products. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that we are suffering the drought we are in many areas, but yet yields are, you know, better than they would have been if you look back 20 and 30 years ago. And many times that's due to the technology that the seed now carries. Um, and you know, for frankly, for some of the technology company, it, it it's probably the case that sometimes the enthusiasm for the idea gets a little bit ahead of the idea. Um, but that's okay. Um, that's okay. It'll 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 prove out, and uh, and some won't. And uh, and that's the nature that's the nature of the space. But I think it's really an exciting time, as as John points out, for people entering the space and becoming part of agriculture, one of the reasons I think they are uh, is because they see these opportunities. And, uh, and it isn't farming practices of 30 years ago, it's farming practices of five years from now uh, and 10 years from now. And I think that's what gets people jazzed about this space is they see those opportunities and see this could, this is really cool stuff. And, uh, and some won't work and some will crash and burn but I think there's just going to be, there also are going to be ideas that really take off. Okay, just to follow a point to that, you mentioned the labor side. I know we work really hard. My son-in-law has done a great job of, of training, retraining, and taking that average employee and giving them the technology skills. And I think as we move forward, uh, Jay, in this business, we absolutely have to be looking at at what levels of employee management we can gain and get to uh, within our dairy uh, uh, businesses and you know with any business here it, it's critically important yeah i think I, I agreed john i mean if there's one word i think we all could agree on uh, and a need for agriculture going forward it's talent uh, yes. and you could apply that word to any place along the supply chain uh, but we need talent no, those those are good points. I just you know just to follow up on the on the labor side, uh, you know one of the one of the points uh, that the secretary touched on was the the urban landscaping uh, the you know the the urban landscape change 
uh, of agriculture going from, you know, we got a very diverse um, agricultural community. We have uh, large farms, uh, you know, very much interested in, in more markets and, and export, and we have small um, uh, pepper farms uh, looking to access uh, the, the local and regional um, food systems. Uh, one of the things in terms of, uh, to take off your point, Jay, of looking for talent and, and the need for talent all across the spectrum, uh, uh, Mike Cook mentioned that uh, over half the broiler production in Missouri and Arkansas is now owned by the Hmong community. And um, is there, is there, do you have programs in your organizations, uh, you know, any of our panelists uh, that, that seek to provide the resources uh, uh, to assist uh, the, this diverse uh, group of, of producers that are coming into our agricultural system? You know, an example is uh, uh, Mike. Mike serves on the on the board of a of a farm credit association down in Missouri, and he referenced two years ago that we need to have a uh, you know a, someone uh, on the bank personnel that speaks Hmong to be able to provide the farm credit uh, resource to to these producers. It, it is. Is, is there a strategy in your organizations to kind of expand, you know, whether it's training John Rudinger, as you just said, or uh, provide other resources to the kind of the diverse group of, of producers that's coming into agriculture? Yeah, I, I guess if you're, if I can uh, take the lead on that, Michael, yeah, I, uh, we really, uh, uh, work hard on that training on the farm level, but when you look at uh, what Genix is doing uh, with within their team training programs uh, uh, within the countries that they're working in, uh, they do take that to a higher level and uh, really work uh, in country specific areas uh, and and we do that multitask multi training aspects uh, within all of the uh, markets that we have. Yes. Thank so Michael, you. Michael, I, 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 just, uh, I would just say this. We, um, so many times we serve those, um, I'll use your example, uh, a, a, a farming operation owned by a Hmong family. And so we employ agronomists that do speak and can uh, work with, with, with people Wonderful. Um, that, that, that just makes us more effective as a supplier and makes us you know, a, a better partner. Uh, so we very much do it. I, I might just step back, though, a little bit from the question. And, and just as we think about talent going forward, I think th the diversity within the talent base is just going to continue to grow uh, for at CHS, but perhaps for the others on the call, too, uh, in dealing with, you know, agricultural producers, products, processing all along the supply chain. And I think it's a good thing. But, um, you know, our our newest agronomist very much uh, may have grown up in Los Angeles, California and never set, set foot on a farm. But she's jazzed about agriculture. She wants to let producers do better and, uh, and is just you know, fired up to do that. And I think that's, that's terrific. A different type of an agronomist that probably that we hired 30 years ago. All right. I, well, th thank you for your comments on that. I think it's an important part as we look at the future of agriculture is to, you know, realize that we've got a very uh, a growing, uh, diverse uh, group of, of producers uh, in America. And uh, uh, obviously we need to uh, be able to provide access to our, our systems and, and programs uh, to, to help them be successful. Um, one of the one of the references uh, that the secretary made when he was talking about ag tech, and I guess it was the the vertical farming uh, that I, I think is is coming, uh, was was consumer choice um, it, it is going to uh, play into it, um, and uh, I think he used the Triscuit uh, uh, story or you know choosing uh, the uh, tomato um, and which one you have. 
you prefer as a consumer. Um, John Gingo, I, uh, Applegate is a consumer facing branded company. And so I, you know, consumer choice is, is very much, I assume at the forefront of your company's strategy to expand its, its products, um, you know, both domestically and, and probably globally. Can you give us some insight into how you use uh, consumer choice uh, in your um, in your company strategy? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great topic, and I was really um, pleased to hear hear the secretary talking about consumer choice so prominently because I do think it's in a lot of ways the um, the gateway to so much of the change that we'll see in the future. Um, you know, if I think about um, ag tech and consumer choice, kind of the overlap of those two. Regenerative agriculture is something that's based on old principles, right? So when you explain it and you talk about animals being outdoors and on pasture, people can get their head around it, but it feels very old and sort of inefficient and almost antiquated, right? Ag tech really is where you bring it to the forefront. You say, how do we take the principles of the old, but leverage things like Secretary Vilsack mentioned, drones, precision agriculture, uh, satellite photography, how do you use those tools to take the principles of the old and actually bring it way into the future, right? That's that's what's going on in the regenerative ranches we're working with today. Those are the tools that are being employed. And so when I think about consumer choice, there's a couple of things. One is, you know, scaling this market, bringing efficiency to a new market, right? Which isn't built just for efficiency, but it's built on other principles, is how you give consumers an economically viable choice, right? And that was a lot of the work that Applegate had done historically on antibiotics is how do you bring efficiency to a market where animals, you actually learn how to raise animals without an over-reliance on antibiotics. It's the same principle. And then how can you have an economically viable, reasonably priced alternative for consumers to give them a choice in front of them? And then the second point is just the storytelling. So, so much of this from a consumer standpoint is the education, the storytelling, the proof points you can offer so that, you know, you can, you can, you can first of all paint a picture of the challenges, but then paint a very uh, you know visual, enticing, and appetizing picture of the future. And so uh, you know those proof points of storytelling. The other the other piece I'll mention is when you get into these new spaces, it's hard, right? Consumers are trying to navigate. This was raised here. This was raised there. That seems more sustainable. That what does regenerative mean? So the more we can come back to measurement and actual outcomes, um, right? So, so some of the new technology is really helping us get to measurable outcomes. So are we actually adding biodiversity to land? Are we actually sequestering more carbon? These are measurable things. Um, and so consumers need proof points, right? No matter how deep they wanna go into that story, they need proof points. So I think it's a challenge for all of us to say, in a very complicated world, when you work in the industry, how can you boil things down to be explainable, informative, and clear consumer choice right at the point of purchase? And that's a lot of what we do, kind of in our role at Applegate, is try to get those choices in front of the consumer. Yeah, that's uh, th those are great points. The education, the storytelling, the proof points, um, you, you know, the measurement and the outcomes. Um, it, it, it sounds very familiar. Uh, uh, we, we have a number of uh, participants uh, uh, that, that supply uh, corn and, and uh, own uh, locally owned uh, ethanol processing uh, facilities. And um, uh, I, I know the industry has been very focused on that consumer choice uh, and that storytelling to t talk about the fact that that uh, ethanol today is a lower carbon, uh, you know, alternative uh, fuel, uh, and uh, and and I think it it goes to the point that uh, you know a company like Applegate is really engaged in the same kinds of strategies uh, to to develop its uh, brand uh, with, uh, with for for consumer choice. So I, I think that's uh, illustrative um, uh, of the need in agriculture to do that. Um, I want to spend a, a few minutes with, uh, with our, maybe our last topic. Um, uh, and that's, uh, there's been a, there's a lot of news today on sustainability and carbon. And so I, 
uh, and, and that's a that's a broad word uh, that that can that means uh, a lot of different things to different organizations and and, and frankly um, uh, consumers and 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 governments that that regulate us in our markets um, how is your organization kind of addressing uh, the 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 news uh, the sustainability and carbon discussion and and what do you see as your um, uh, strategies to kind of uh, strengthen your your supply chain or your um, p penetration into markets uh, in that in that um, in that context in that discussion that's that's happening today about sustainability and carbon and um, yeah, uh, Leah, uh, I guess, could I start with you to, to try to, to talk a little bit about how uh, sustainability and, and carbon goes into your um, company's uh, strategy uh, to, to move forward? Absolutely. Yeah, carbon is absolutely at the heart of what we do. You know, we often like to say we're in the business of taking greenhouse gases and turning that into polymers and into performance materials. And so, you know, by design, our product has a carbon footprint that's two thirds less than oil based plastics. So fundamentally, we're all about the low carbon footprint. But I think that what we're seeing and what we think is important in the future is understanding how a material like ours or how these things cascade through supply chains. So earlier I had mentioned a bit about uh, food waste in landfills is a good example. So if you make a tea bag or a coffee capsule out of a low carbon footprint material, that's great. It's two thirds less. That's a great start. But by keeping food waste out of landfills and keeping it from generating methane, you have an additional impact on um, greenhouse gases and the effects of climate change. And even once you make compost from these materials, by using compost as a soil amendment, you can come back around to sequestering more carbon in soils. And so we are a raw material producer, but we think it's incumbent upon us to understand how a material like ours cascades and affects carbon, not just in how we make our material, but how that affects applications throughout the entire process. Or even in a non-compostable product, um, for example, in 3D printing, how do we, you know, how do we understand the carbon assessment of our material versus others? And then how do we see that play out as you throw away parts that are 3D printed? You know, what is the carbon impact when you send them through mechanical or chemical recycling? And so we're seeing that even an upstream producer like NatureWorks, we have to be able to account for carbon throughout this entire process, because that's what NGOs expect of us. It's what brand owners expect of us. And it's what the consumers are expecting of the brands that they buy from, I think. So, you know, John's point about education and storytelling for consumers, I, I feel that's the same throughout our entire supply chain. We work really hard to communicate, not just to the people who buy our material, but um, all the way down to the brand and retailer, retailer level. And they're all looking for, what is the carbon impact? What is the carbon, you know, what is the data that you have to tell us um, how this is gonna affect um, the consumer throwing something away? Um, so it's a really, we're required to have a really integrated approach and a really deep um, measurable technical understanding of our carbon footprint. And so all this talk about ag tech and being able to measure is really important to, to us as a polymer producer as well, because we're expected to be able to share that data with our supply chains that aren't necessarily familiar with farming practices and agriculture. And so we need to be able to translate that data and those carbon impacts um, to some very interesting global supply chains. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, John Gingo, obviously uh, regenerative uh, agriculture and regeneratively uh, uh, produced meat and beef uh, is central uh, to your company's mission. Um, it can, do you, can you give us some um, specifics on how you're, you're moving that conversation forward with your consumers? Um, is it, you know, do you, uh, in your, either in your supply chain and how you measure or how, how is Applegate uh, taking this uh, discussion on, on carbon and sustainability and, 
and moving its uh, products forward? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, I mean, certainly for us, uh, we want to go beyond sustainability, right? That's our focus and regeneration is really the next step beyond sustainability and our consumers, you know, when you get deeper with them, that's where they want to go as well, right? It's a, it's a place where a lot of consumers want to go. So there's two things. One is, uh, you know, our focus is supporting farmers who want to farm this way, who want to have their animals out of pasture, who want to be restoring their land, right? So we're looking to find and support those farmers on the back end and then help um, connect them to training and tools to make that way of farming more efficient. So we're working with an organization, the State Savory Institute, uh, who does exactly that from a, a hub and spoke system where they actually operate out of regional hubs, where they work with local farmers to train and educate on regenerative practices and measurement. Uh, so we work with Savory as well, and, and, and we actually are working with them on a certification program, their certification program, which is based on measurable outcomes. And that's the consumer side of it, right? So we can bring that story full circle from the work we're doing with the farmers, supporting the practice, right to a certification, which we'll have on package and then available for consumers to dig into and learn more about what that means and that they can feel good that the actual impact is happening on the land and for the environment. So uh, partnerships are key in this, right? Anytime you're starting to build a new market, you really need to be thinking about who are the partners who can bring people together to tell a bigger story. So Savory is also working with apparel companies on how do you use the hides of the animals uh, that are raised this way to create boots and clothing, right? In addition to the hot dogs that we'll be making so we can work together as a community to tell the story. So I get excited about it because I look at the future one year, five year, 10 years down the road. And I think we're gonna get better and better at this. I like that connecting um, and supporting farmers who, who choose to, to have their animals out um, uh, on pasture, uh, connecting them to resources. Uh, uh, I think that's, that's informative because uh, uh, my, my, son, uh, uh, my son works on, a, on an organic farm out in uh, north of Portland, Maine, Wolf's Neck. And, um, you know, bringing their products to, to market uh, is an important um, challenge uh, that they uh, need to uh, address. And I think uh, connecting with a brand like uh, Applegate uh, might, might provide an avenue uh, for these types of, of farmers. Um, Jay, uh, you know, we, we talked uh, about how, uh, you know, carbon and sustainability in and of itself can be a an hour or a, a, a week uh, a, a program. Um, how is uh, how is CHS um, kind of addressing this conversation in in your organization? So as you can imagine, it's a it's a huge topic, and uh, and we have a lot of resources against it. Because I'll just uh, I'll just kind of look at that uh, about that business model that I described early in the call. You know, when we move grain around the world, our questions that we receive. Uh, from buyers of that grain, whether the, if they be uh, United States buyers around sustainability, uh, if they be a buyer in Spain, if they be a buyer in Vietnam, they're different. They're different. And, uh, and in each country, they're important to those buyers. Uh, and then if you kind of come up our chain a little bit to, uh, to when we are selling products and services to, to grow and mature a crop, um, you know, the, the, the fertilizer applic application, the fertilizer optimization, uh, not using one bit more fertilizer than is absolutely required, has got its own sustainability kind of um, topic around it. And then we look at, you know, fuels we sell to equipment to put crop in, um, you know, and, uh, and the topics around sustainability around fuels. Um, as a company, we've been in the renewable fuels uh, business for, for, for almost 40 years. We were selling uh, ethanol into gasoline back when it was called gas a hall. Uh, and, uh, and, and putting soybean oil in a diesel fuel as biodiesel is something we've been uh, doing it as long as anybody in the country. So we've got aspects all along our supply chain where the word sustainability has has a certain amount of commonality to it, but it has also its own significant differences. Uh, so that's where I kind of come back to the, the fact is we've got to adapt as these customers around the world um, 
have needs that we need to meet. And as you know, government and, uh, and other regulations come at us, even within the US, is not to fight back, not to be defensive, to adapt. And, and inside there will be opportunities. Inside there will be opportunities. Um, I think the other, one thing I would probably also put out there is, you, you know, we, the, the secretary has spoken in the past, uh, uh, been on other groups with him, you know, about, um, you know, some of the sustainability uh, opportunities coming to agriculture should be, um, should be voluntary and incentive based. And I agree with them and who, and, and who wouldn't. Uh, I think we also got to keep in mind there, there could be a day in the future where then they're not voluntary. Uh, and, and how do we live in that world uh, where, That's right. where some of those rules and regulations could be, have more teeth to them uh, that it becomes the new rules of the game. And, and we're, we're seeing uh, that, think, we're, yeah, yeah we're, we're seeing that, Jay, excuse me, we're seeing that in, in capital markets, for example. Uh, companies that uh, are, are public companies uh, are going to have uh, qualitative and quantitative um, requirements right. on reporting on sustainability and, and uh, uh, low carbon uh, policies within their organizations. So... It's it is going to be you know mandated uh, uh, likely coming down coming down the road here. So that that's a great point. Hey, we're we're uh, we're coming up. Uh, I, may, maybe we won't uh, finish exactly on time because I in, in our final uh, couple of minutes, I'd like to ask each of our uh, panelists, similar to to Mike Droke asking the secretary. Um, uh, on two or three uh, key takeaways that that you would provide our uh, participants on uh, on the future uh, of agriculture and and moving forward in a in a decarbonizing uh, global economy, uh, may, maybe Leah Ford, do you want to kick us off? Absolutely, I think that my key takeaway on the future of agriculture is you know as we start to use agriculture for um, new end uses like biopolymers and materials. It's important to know we're selling into markets that are not traditionally familiar with farming and agricultural practices. And so we are seeing a lot of need for transparency, data, and third-party certification over how agriculture is conducted. Because if you are, for example, a 3D printing company and you're making filament, you're not traditionally familiar with um, what makes a sustainable agricultural process. We are, however, supplying into markets that are deeply invested in the concepts of sustainability, but may not know exactly what that should mean all the way upstream. And so being able to use ag tech to be able to measure impacts on a farm and be able to feed that for us into a third party certification that we can use to translate those stories down to our markets so that they can feel confidence that um, they're sourcing something that is low carbon, that doesn't have detrimental impacts to the environment, that supports really important concepts like soil health, and biodiversity. Um, we really need to be able to do that when we're working in these um, newer materials markets. So I think that's really important. And the other one is, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you talked a lot about infrastructure today. And from our perspective, infrastructure also needs to include waste infrastructure and especially composting infrastructure because we think that composting infrastructure is going to be really important when coming back to agriculture if we want to have you know regenerative agricultural practices and protect soil health there's a lot of really excellent data that has been coming out showing how compost as a product can be used to increase biodiversity and sequester carbon in soils. But in order to make a real meaningful difference, we need a lot of compost, meaning we're gonna need a lot of infrastructure to be able to collect that food waste and um, be able to create these really important soil amendments. So um, it's not necessarily a part of infrastructure that always comes to mind for people at first, but we've seen a lot of momentum across the US to grow that type of infrastructure and interest at the federal level for being able to support its continued growth. So those are those Thank are my you. two big ones. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, John Rudiger, a couple yeah, of takeaways um, for our audience. Yeah. 
I think uh, one of the things we need to do is tell the agriculture story and tell them really how good we are at what we do. And uh, that really in agriculture, uh, we're not afraid to invest and to invest in for the long term. And we've talked a lot about that today uh, with our panel, invest uh, in people, invest in technologies, invest for the long term. So, so I think you just don't be afraid to do that as an, as an industry, as an organization. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, methane production uh, on the dairy farm here, looking at trying to produce uh, gas from our cow manure and market that. Don't be afraid to try that, but go in with your wide, eyes wide open uh, to where, you, uh, where these things are and, and don't be afraid to ask questions and to seek out the right people to gain answers for you. I think that's extremely important uh, as well. But again, uh, utilize the next generation of producers uh, coming along to find that talent for you in your business. I think that'll go a lot farther than you think. Uh, just study what that is as a business, as a company, and, and to work toward that. But again, just tell your story, be you, and I think uh, the world and, and everything will come along and, uh, and it'll move toward a more freer uh, carbon neutral environment that we can all live in. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Great comments. Uh, John Gingo. Uh, thanks. I have two, two comments here at the end. Uh, one is picking up on uh, Secretary Vilsack's, uh, I'll say his challenge of new markets, but then his comment around efficiency. And I think he said, you know, efficiency comes at a price. Um, and so, you know, it's not efficiency at all cost. And I guess the way I think about that is we're in a free market. We're talking about consumer choice. Of course, we need to be efficient with how we do things. But when you define a new market, you know, don't be afraid to define a new market. That might not be the most efficient new market. It might be a differentiated market. Bring transparency to that, bring storytelling to that, create the new market, and then drive the hell out of efficiency within that new market, right? What's the smartest way to use technology, to use data, to use science, to bring efficiency within that new market? So I think sometimes we do get a little bit lost in some of the new markets feel less efficient, that's okay. They might be better ways to do things in the long run and we can bring efficiency within those new markets. So that's point one. And then point two, which brings me back a little bit to um, regenerative agriculture and clearly my passion point, which is uh, animal agriculture can be and needs to be you know, a big part of the future of food, the future of agriculture, despite some of the prevailing narrative that animal agriculture is a source of the problem. Actually, it can be a source of solution. And I just want to remind uh, those in the audience of that, uh, clearly a personal uh, passion point for me and for Applegate. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Debertine. So Michael, I'll just leave you with two. Uh, and the, the first one is around talent. Uh, in, increasingly, we know that people joining companies, people working in industries, want to be about something bigger than themselves. And everybody on this call is in an industry that is exactly that. We help feed people around the world. Uh, and we don't have to make it up. We don't have to try to develop a fancy phrase. That's what we do. And, and we, inside that space, we have great opportunities and we have great excitement with technology, with practices, with, that, with, with, with fulfilling that goal of helping feed people. So this talent recruitment, I think, is just an exciting opportunity for us going forward. And my second point is the U.S. farmer. The U.S. farmer can compete with anyone around the world. So we start with an incredibly good playing field. Wow. Well, I have to say that uh, your, your comments uh, from the four of you um, really leave me with inspiration and excitement to go forward uh, in the future of agriculture. And I agree wholeheartedly uh, with all of your comments. So, okay, that's a wrap, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of myself and, and everyone here at Dorsey and Whitney, uh, thank you, Secretary Vilsack. Uh, thank you, Leah Ford, John Rudinger, John Gingo, and Jay Debertine 
for taking time to share your thoughts and visions on the future of agriculture. We really appreciate it. And a special thanks to our participants um, for taking the time out of your busy schedules um, to uh, listen in to our leaders in agriculture as they discuss uh, the future of agriculture. So we look forward to assisting you uh, tackle our challenges and uh, take advantage of our opportunities um, and uh, appreciate you uh, participating in the program. Uh, we will be sending you a survey uh, uh, for the program uh, that you can share your criticisms and, and comments uh, and suggestions or thoughts on next year's The Future of Agricultural Roundtable, or certainly you know, feel free to email me uh, with your thoughts and suggestions at uh, weaver.michael at dorsey.com. And I wish all of our uh, producers uh, a bountiful and safe harvest. Thank you.